Well, hello, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Oh, we got some awesome special people here today. Hi, Justin. How are you? Uh, good. How are you? Good, good. I'm good. excited to have you here today on this class. This is one of my favorites. So I was trying to set it all up for Valentine's Day, but oh, well, we adjust, don't we? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we adjust and adapt. And uh, so Justin actually just got engaged last week, right? Congratulations. Thank you. Agreed to do this class on Valentine's Day. He goes, oh, <laughs> we did the big stuff last week. I'm like, okay, youngin, number one, no matter what she says, you should have <laughs> <something>, right? <laughs> so I'm excited. Let's see, we have Frank here. Hi, Frank. Frank, how long have you been married? What, 30 years or something crazy? 33? Three oh. Okay, I can't read sign language clearly. <laughs> <laughs> thirty years. So my thirty husband years. Joe, like, thirty husband years. Joe, yeah, thirty. My husband Joe and I have been together thirty-seven years. We'll be married thirty-three in May, I think. Wait, hold on. Uh, thirty-two years in May. That's how bad when you can't remember how long you've been together, right? Ah. Uh, so good deal. Well, I am ready to get started. I'm excited about today's class. So let me get my little PowerPoint up here and we will get this party started. All right. Okay, so let's get this uh, moved so you don't have to see all that fun stuff. So Here's one of my favorite things, you guys. One of the biggest challenges that I see is agents have not learned how to delegate, right? So we're going to dive into some of this stuff. And today I have my special guest here with me, Justin Nelson, who runs and operates and owns and all that fancy stuff, uh, Sphere Rocket VA. And so he, how long have you been in business, Justin? Uh, I've been in real estate almost, man, 10 years now. Um, and the Sphere Rocket VA side with virtual assistants, we're just at three years as of almost today, actually. So, wow, that's insane. So what, tell me, uh, what made you decide to start Sphere Rocket? Like, what was the, the psychology behind that? Yeah, I mean, so honestly, the psychology is being in real estate since I was 16, you know, um, I obviously saw, you know, real estate from a different perspective, you know, I was going to school to be an engineer, um, you know, so I kind of, I was so young that everybody, you know, it, it was all a foreign world to me, right, everybody I was learning from was probably at least 30, um, you know, some up into their 60s, 70s, 80s, even though they've been in the business a very long time. And so I kind of got to see, um, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? I saw people that were in their 70s and 80s that regretted the last 50 years of how they had built a business. Um, I saw people in their 40s, you know, that were running businesses the best way they knew how to, right? All by themselves, you know, shouldering the, you know, the brunt. I saw my dad do that, right? You know, really having to build a big business, which, you know, obviously, at the beginning time made him kind of disconnect a little bit from the family, you know, not in a bad way, but in a way that's like, Hey, I'm a bit busy. I'm trying to build something that's hard to build. And so, you know, I really got to see, you know, the struggles of, you know, a wide age range of people. And it all kind of came down to the same thing is just delegation, right? You know, we saw the main difference between someone that struggled financially or just struggled time-wise, right? I think a lot of us don't necessarily struggle financially, but we struggle with, you know, trying to achieve new goals, trying to do it all ourselves. And so um, as I did that and built a real estate business, I just kind of saw that there was such a need for people to leverage and, you know, in, in today's economy, you know, it's hard to go and spend, you know, especially in where, depending on where you live, it's hard to go spend a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars on a salary, right? Or even fifty, right? It's still a lot of money. And so the VA route was a route that kind of the top one percent of agents kept a secret, right? They made it sound super difficult or scary or that it didn't work. And so I just, you know, that's what kind of prompted me to start it. I wanted to scare, start something that wasn't as scary, um, you know, wasn't as cumbersome, and you know, the average, you know, business owner could understand and you know, take the leap of faith into. You know, and it, it, it's so valuable because I've been in real estate now. Um, I laugh and tease you. I've been in real estate longer than you are old, right? So I've been in real estate 29 years. Yeah. And I remember when my son, John, it, I mean, it makes me cry just thinking about it, was about four or five years old. And he called me and he said, 
I got this voicemail. I still have the voicemail recorded. And it said, Mom, we're supposed to go to the movies today. Mom, are you going to make it home? You said you'd be here at four o'clock, Mom. Well, it looks like you're not going to make it home today, Mom. But I love you. I'll see you soon. Crushed me, like broke my heart, right? And that was actually a really important turning point for me where I said, okay, I need to figure this out. I need to figure out how not to do, try to do everything and not be there for the most important and impactful people in my life. Right. Yep. So that son is now, you know, 26 years old and I have another one, 28, getting ready to have a baby. And, you know, you can't take those years back. You can't take that time back in any way, shape or form. So let's dive in a little bit and talk about a couple of things. So first of all, what I know is you can do anything, right? We're all tough, but we can't do everything. And we have it in our head. And, uh, you know, this probably sounds sexist a little bit, but I think women more so than men feel like we have to do it all and we can't delegate anything, right? And the truth is you have to remember there are no life-threatening emergencies in real estate, right? Like we think, oh my God, it's the end of the world, right? Everything is going to change. And there are no life-threatening emergencies, even though it might feel like it in the moment. There's nothing that says, oh my God, if you don't do this, you're going to die, right? And I think that's where we really get caught up in a lot of this stuff. Like everything has to be done right now and has to be done by us, right? And so I came up with this simple form years ago where you take just a few days and you write down everything you do all day, everything you do in a day. And I'll tell you that I even, you know, I I feel like I know it all, but clearly I don't. I will never forget sitting in your workshop, uh, your event in May. And I remember when you were talking about, so I thought that this was insane, but now I don't think it's quite so insane. He literally, Justin literally attached a GoPro to himself, right? Is that what you did, Justin? You attached a GoPro to yourself all day? I did. So it could monitor because I mean, the problem is, is even when I, I tried to do the write down everything all day, like that's, that's by far a better solution than never doing it. But, you know, I, I would kind of lie to myself. I'd be like, all right, what did I do today? And I, and, you know, I'd leave out that I watched 20 minutes of TikTok. And I'd leave out that I watched 20 minutes of cat videos on YouTube. And then, you know, so when I looked at my day, I left out like all these things because I was kind of embarrassed by what I was doing time-wise because I was still probably like a lot of agents. I was still making good money, right? I was still surviving, but I wasn't thriving. I was surviving, not thriving. And so um, that's why, yeah, I put a GoPro on myself because video doesn't lie. I mean, it wouldn't lie on what I was doing with my time. I just think that that's so valuable, right? So how many of you guys are really lying to yourselves on what you're doing every day? So if you look at this, if you take this list of all the things you're doing, and obviously this didn't include a lot of the things that Justin just mentioned, right? It talks about how much are you spent time you spending doing emails, checking voicemail, follow-up calls, postcards, Facebook, dry cleaning, website leads, right? New listings, buyer appointments. How much of your time are you actually spending doing this work and the stuff that brings you revenue? And if you then take that same list of everything that you do in a day and you choose a category on the left, love, and on the right, hate, now guess what? Everything that you hate to do, all the stuff that you don't love to do, you need to learn how to delegate. And That is probably one of the hardest things that I see people do is how to delegate because they think, number one, nobody can do the job as well as I can, right? They're recovering. Well, they're not even recovering. They're control freaks. Yep. And they think that uh, they're not going to do it as well as I do. Nobody has common sense. I can't hire good help, right? Like, what are some of the excuses you hear, Justin? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot. There's obviously, I can't hire good help. I think the biggest one we see is people... um, we've at least in the real estate industry we've all heard about like mega teams and like hey you should grow a team and you know we all see these teams that grow massively and it just looks like a pain and it doesn't look fun right they're they're just not living a good life and we confuse that with hiring right so we're like we don't i don't want a team i want to be by myself i want to be a you know a solo agent and we just get in our mind that you know you can still be a solo agent and still have a team around you right they don't have to be buyers agents they don't have to be listing agents and so i think a big thing i hear is like they won't even get to this little like uh, chart you have here 
because they just don't even see themselves as being worthy of having an assistant, right? Uh, you know, uh, admin, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I think that's the biggest excuse I see. It's not even an excuse. It's just people are, you know, we, we don't see it as life changing um, because we've never had it in our lives before. So, you know, I, I think that's so valuable too, because here's what I've seen and, and maybe you have a different a different opinion. But what I see is the average agent. Well, first of all, keep in mind that the average agent across the U.S. only closes about three to four deals a year, right? But if you are above the average and you're closing 12 to 18, what I see typically is they make it to about 18 deals without help. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get the help at that 18 deals, they bounce back and they stay in that 12 to 18 because they get overwhelmed, they get frustrated, they get stressed out, and they don't push themselves any harder and they won't hire help. Yep. The ones that I see that hire help are the ones, or, or I'm sorry, the ones that I see that push through that 18 unit ceiling are the ones that find and figure out a way to get help. Because most agents use the seagull approach, right? Yep. What they do is the first one that's breathing that walks by, they grab them, they throw them in a desk and they fly by, dump a bunch of crap on their desk and fly out. Right? And then they don't do any training. They don't teach them anything. Then they come back a couple of weeks later and they're like, and the person is sitting there confused, doesn't know what's priority, what's not priority. And guess what? Next thing you know, that that agent is like, see, I can't get good help. They don't have any common sense. They don't know what, right? And yeah. so- they don't end up hiring the right people. So I wrote out kind of a brief job description. And I know Justin probably has a lot of stuff to add to this. And keep in mind, a lot of this was created without virtual assistance. And now that I have been enlightened <laughs> to virtual assistance and what they do for you, uh, this job description can change. And I know that Sphere Rocket has a lot of job descriptions that you guys can utilize. We have people on our team now we have uh, three, four virtual assistants at the moment, and they are doing anything from video editing to graphic design. Um, in fact, this Zoom background behind me and part of this presentation was made by our virtual assistants. We actually have a virtual assistant that is a full-time transaction coordinator, and he is one of the best TCs I've ever had. And he is doing and handling all of our files for our entire team. So if you take a lot of those things that you don't love and you start to delegate them and create some sort of job description. So what are, give us some examples. Well, I think the funniest one that you have, Justin, is one where you, um, with your GoPro, you showed your refrigerator so that your yep. assistants actually order food for you, which I think is amazing. I never even thought, actually, the one that's better than that is that you have a can or had a camera on your laundry room. Yep. So you have somebody come to your laundry. So tell us some of the things that you use virtual assistants for. Yeah. So, I mean, usually when it comes to virtual assistants, you know, you can use them for business leverage or, you know, personal leverage. One of the things I teach people all the time is, you know, usually what's crazy about our business is it's our personal thing. So it's kind of like a a certain order you got to go in. If you went and got all this leverage in your business and you get more busy and, you know, uh, you get leverage, you still go home to, uh, you know, a, a yard that needs cut. You still go home to have to go and figure out what do you need to buy from the grocery store. You go home and it's harder to recharge when you don't have some of those things leveraged. So what's really interesting is we, we, some, and it doesn't make me money because, you know, a lot of people can leverage their home stuff um, without even using our company or virtual assistants, right? So, you know, even before you get VAs, I challenge people, hey, how can we, you know, have you stop cutting your lawn? How can you stop spending three hours on the weekend at the grocery store? And now the key here is that if you love one of those activities, I'm not saying get rid of it if you love it, right? However, when we really analyze what are we doing that we don't love, like kind of that love hate list, you're going to find most of those on there. And, and the other thing too is you might enjoy cutting your grass, but do you enjoy cutting your grass at the expense of maybe not being able to work an extra hour or two at work, which for a lot of us might make us an extra 20 grand. So like in my mind, when I was going through a lot of this, like I enjoyed grocery shopping. I loved going to the store. I'm a bigger guy. I love to eat. Like it's just who I am. And I love going to the store, seeing things. But what I figured out was, is I love now being able to take that three hours of grocery shopping, go spend that three hours a week in my business for me personally, make an extra $30,000 a quarter, a month, you know, whatever your average commission prices are. 
and go spend that on finer dining, right? You know, and everybody's got different motivations in life, but what you find is a lot of them stem out of your personal. So if you weren't cleaning your house as much, you know, maybe you could spend it with your kids. I don't have kids, but a lot of times people retake that energy allocation. Like, could you be closer to your kids if you weren't cutting your lawn for three and a half hours on your acre property on a Saturday, right? So we have to ask ourselves those questions and that's kind of, you know, uh, just a few of the activities, at least in the personal world. You know, what I love about that is so things have evolved pretty dramatically since I've been in business over 29 years. But the truth that I found, too, and this wasn't even part of the presentation, but it, it came up, is that for men and women, many times leadership defines different things. So in most situations, not all, when men go and run companies and become leaders of companies, they in many situations have a wife at home, right? Mm -hmm. Or they have a significant other or a partner at home that takes care of a lot of those things like laundry, like grocery shopping, like making kids dentist appointments and all of these things, right? Mm -hmm. But what I know is that when women go to work and women become in leadership roles, they don't typically have that same person at home that is doing all those things at home. And so I know when I started in real estate, my husband was traveling a lot, working full-time uh, in the corporate world. And I said, okay, well, if you get a wife, I get one too. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, so, well, what does that mean? They said, well, I'm going to hire a house manager. And I hired a nanny for my kids 29 years ago. And the beauty of it was when I came home after work, my house was already clean. Dinner was already ready. Laundry was already done so that I could actually spend and enjoy time with my kids. Well, the funny thing is now 29 years later, my kids are grown. I still have my house manager after 29 years. And people are like, why do you still have a nanny? I go, well, she was never there for the kids. She was always there for me, right? To help me and allow me to do the things. Like I can't stand to do laundry. God bless you guys who love, there's people out there who love to do laundry. And I have not done laundry in 29 years. In fact, not too long ago, we had to replace our washer and dryer, right? So the delivery guy comes and he puts it all in. And uh, he comes to me and says, well, come here, Mrs. Crispillo, and I'll show you how to use it. My husband starts rolling and laughing in the corner. He's like, mm, you might want to show me because <laughs> I haven't done laundry in a long time. It's not my greatest strength. I'm one of those people who yeah, I throw it in the washing machine and I forget about it. And then I come back the next day and now it all smells bad. So I have to wash it again. I have to, you know, go through that two or three times before I put it in the dryer and then I hate folding it. So, I mean, anyway, I could, I digress. But the reality is, is that you can hire people to de definitely do those things mm -hmm. that you don't love to do. We stay married because we have somebody take care of our lawn and our pool. Because <laughs> right? when my husband was responsible for it, he's a great businessman. He's not a great handyman. So we would have, you know, knee high lawns and green pools, not ideal. Yep. So let's talk briefly about writing an ad. And Justin, I saw you posted a link here in the chat. Is that link yeah. for? Yeah, that's a top 300 task list that we see people leverage. So oh, Love it. Yeah. yeah. So 300 items, you guys, I only had a few, right? So they have over 300 of things that you can delegate. So in writing a great ad, a lot of times what you want to do is you want to, again, put down the things that are most important to you. Like when I was hiring a marketing director, one of the most important things to me was I wanted to know that they knew how to use, you know, PowerPoint and uh, they knew how to use, create a PDF and they knew all these basic tech skills, right? Some of this has now changed over the years. But what I didn't want is somebody to come to the job and say, oh, I don't know how to get into Word, right? <laughs> and then you're scrambling trying to train somebody how to use a Word document. Like think about the things that are most important to you. And in thinking about deciding who to hire, I think that this is really helpful. And maybe you have some insight into this, but there are so many different types of assistants, right? And Justin just posted a link with over 300 different things. I only have four labeled here. <laughs> but there's so many things that people can do, whether it is a personal assistant all the way to administrative marketing. Now we have people who are doing video and graphic design and social media and like do you even read your email anymore Justin I don't know the last time I read my email I mean honestly I I read emails like I don't 
I don't actually open like my email inbox. So my team will, you know, they'll go through the thousand and, you know, they'll send me actually in Facebook Messenger, like the top 20 that are like pressing or client issues or, you know, something I missed or, you know, things like that. But as far as actually getting into my email, very, very rarely. Yeah. And how much time are you guys wasting in email? I know for myself that I tracked it for a bit and I would literally like you, you get those notifications that create that psychology in your head where you feel like you have to check it every second. So one of the first things I learned to do was to turn off all my notifications. Right. And so that I wasn't constantly, it was like a, what is that Pavlov's dog or something where you're kind of like every yeah. time the bell rings. <laughs> you're running. Yeah. I'm entertaining myself over here, but the reality is, is that so many tasks can be done that we're not even thinking about. And so if you think about what different requirements should be submitted to be considered, one of my favorite things is a personality profile. And I don't want to dive too deep into this, but what I know is that we have a tendency to hire people that are like us and people we like, which are not necessarily the best people to help you run your business. Would you agree, Justin? I completely agree. I mean, you almost, you know, th there's sometimes you need to hire someone like you, but in the first few hires, you very rarely will ever want someone like you. I mean, eventually down the road, you want someone else to think like you and things like that. But in your first few hires, you just want someone that can do all the things that you don't want to do that they find that they love, right? So a lot of times we we, we have a mindset of, well, I don't want to give an assistant all my like work I don't like, my hate work. But what you don't realize is someone probably loves that work. You just have to find that person. And that might take a week. It might take two days. It might take two years, right? But if we're not starting the process, we'll never you know, be able to get there. So incredibly valuable. So let me show you guys a few different examples of some personality tests. For example, this is mine. This is one. And as you guys can see, I'm a 99D, right? It's probably actually 100%, but they gave me a little bit of credit. And the truth is, is that 99% of my personality is strong, which means I'm not a detailed person, if any of you understand disk profiles. And actually, when I took this recently, my eye went way up more from because I actually really enjoy being more social than I used to be. When you look at this one from 10 years ago, I was running a company at that time and with 120 agents. So my profile was very different. If you look here at a team manager, this was the gal who ran my team at the time, Heather Sims. And on Heather's, what you can see is that she was very much an S, which again, I don't want to dive into the personality differences right now, but she, as you can see, was very different than me, right? She was much more a system, steady, you know, she was, she's probably the calmest, most um, balanced person, especially under fire, under stress. And she just keeps plugging along, right? She's like that turtle, right? She just keeps moving, keeps getting stuff done, right? So think about too what a marketing director might look like. A marketing director is somebody that you want to definitely do a lot more detailed information, right? You want them not making a lot of mistakes in spell check and different things like that. So this all helps you kind of see the variances in personalities. Now, can you imagine if all the people I hired were just like me, a high D? <laughs> it would be insanity. Now, again, as Justin says down the road, when you're looking for a strong person, maybe to run your team or looking for someone to make bigger, higher level decisions, this would be the person you may want to hire. But that's not somebody you're going to want to hire out of the gate, right? Do you have any insight into that, Justin? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I also think this is like whenever the first time you ran your first open house ever, um, I know I was really bad at running my first open house. I failed. I got like, I, I legitimately remember running my open house, getting the papers, getting people to walk in the door. When they walked in the door, I didn't really know what to say to them, but I figured it out. Uh, but I got the, I got all their sign in information. And then I realized that one day I had that I put it in my trunk and then I got busy. I went home, you know, we we're still in contracts. And like three weeks later, I find open my trunk. There's millions of papers in there with names and numbers I never called, right? So I left a lot of money on the table. However, I learned my lesson, right? If I wouldn't have learned that lesson, I wouldn't have been able to progress. A lot of us, what we do is when we hire, um, whether it's a similar personality, whether it's a friend, a colleague, like, I, I don't believe that there's any right way in and of itself. Like people say all the time, don't hire friends. 
my entire organization has hired a friends. Like it's really interesting. I, I wouldn't advise it all the time, but it, I, I only found out that it worked for me because I failed in other ways and did it this way. And so I say all of that to say, you just got to get in the game, right? It could be hiring the cleaner for the first time. You just got to figure out, you just got to get in. You got to, it's like a working out, right? You got to work out that muscle. You got to be used to giving things away. You got to be used to the hiring process. You're going to have to fail in the hiring process. You are going to hire someone and it's not going to work out. And now the question is, do you go try it again? Or do you just go back to normalcy? And that for most people is what they do. Um, and they don't actually get to experience Absolutely. a good hire. So the next most important thing that I see is training rate, right? And it's the biggest mistake that I see. It's that not properly training them to do the job you want done. Like I talked about earlier, the Siegel approach, right? And in training somebody, like, I don't think that anybody ever takes a job with the intent to just screw with you and not do a great job. Right. Mm -hmm. I really genuinely don't think that somebody does that. I think the biggest mistake people make is not taking the time to train them. And, and agents typically say, well, I'm too busy. I don't have time to train them. I need somebody to just come in and do it. And what I've seen many times, too, is if you let somebody else create your system and your processes, when they leave, you're back to zero. You're back to starting all over again. If you create with them the system, for example, if I'm going to teach somebody how to do something, what I've found is the best way to do it is to say, hey, Justin, I would like you to put together this checklist on what my listing presentation looks like. Yep. Justin will say, OK, he takes it. He puts it all together. Ninety nine percent of the time, there's no way he's going to do it right the first time. Not that he didn't do it right. It's that he doesn't necessarily know the way I want it done. So he brings it back to me. I look it over. I'm like, okay, no, we need to make these changes. I give it back to him. We go back and forth three or four times until it's done. Now it's done. Now they know how I want it. I know how I want it. We have it recorded. We've done the training. They completely get it and they understand. But most agents don't even do that part, right? And having a really clear objective is so important to the success of your assistant. And so if you take the time to really upfront define their responsibilities, your expectations and overall goals, it's so worth it in the long run. And I, what I do know is that Justin also with their company, you got to have thousands of hours of training and recorded videos and things mm -hmm. of what needs to be done. Do you not? Yeah, 100%. And I, I think that like, even if you take our company out of the equation, I think a lot of times people don't realize how much information is in the world. Like, let's say, for example, your CRM is KV Core and you hire a VA or you hire an in-person assistant, you hire a college intern, you hire your husband or your wife to do your KV Core or your Boomtown or your Sync or whatever, whatever platform you're using as a CRM. A lot of us think like, like what you just said is perfect. Let's build the training together. But don't forget, there's some trainings you don't need to build, right? Like there, there, there's so much, there's so many YouTube videos. There's so many platforms like KB Core. They have, they have a 50 part training library. Now, let's just be honest with ourselves as business owners, as real estate agents that are busy, I don't know a single person or one of us, unless you're just a really like high, high, per, you know, I personality, S personality engineer that wants to go and watch all 50, 30 minute videos. However, that's something that if we just be the coordinator, as um, we're talking about, coordinate this new hire is going to go through this training. We can use a lot of other people's training as well and combine that with our own that we're making and, and it kind of makes the best of both worlds so don't forget that there's sources out there that people can get trained on but you need to bring those people into your organization first right they got to come into your organization you can't just send someone that doesn't work for you to train and say come one day work for me so we got to get over that hurdle take a risk and bring people into our world and then mentor and be a leader to them i can tell you too that when i hired my very first assistant back in like I had been in real estate less than a year when I hired an assistant. Yeah. And what I can tell you is that my income for that year doubled with just one assistant back then, right? And where I genuinely originally learned about virtual assistants was during the REO crisis. When yeah. I got handed, I was doing 400 BPOs a month, right? 
and got handed 90 properties in 90 days from Fannie Mae and was like, oh crap, what do I do? Yeah. And I'll never forget someone reached out to me and said, I could do this, this, this. I could answer your messages. I could check your email. I could, and said for like four bucks an hour, I'm like, that can't, that can't be right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was like, there's gotta be a scam here somewhere, right? And the interesting thing was I reached out to this gal. I'll never forget. Her name was Ruby and she was in the Philippines. And I said, okay, well, let's, how is this going to work? And we're, I mean, we're talking, this was probably 2010, so 13 years ago. And she's like, well, do you have Skype? I'm like, well, I didn't even know what Skype was back then. And started working with her. And Ruby ended up working with me for eight years, I think. And I ended up helping her build a virtual assistant company over in the Philippines, her own little one. And then Aria went away and I stopped using them. And then I started realizing, oh, I need virtual assistants again. And started going through it again. So set some goals for your assistants, right? Like be as specific as possible as you can. Like look at numbers and deadlines whenever possible. Help them understand what you want them to do. Do you want them making calls? Do you want them sending mailers? Do you want them helping you generate leads? Do you want them, again, creating trainings or video? And here are really the top five reasons that most employees choose to stay. They love the exciting work and challenge, right? Gro- career growth, learning and development, working with great people, fair pay, and a supportive management and good boss. Now, this was so surprising to me because I literally thought that pay would have been number one because I'm a high D personality, so that's how I think. But it wasn't, right? And to find people that were willing, and you guys, some people say, oh, you're taking advantage of them in the Philippines. I, my virtual assistant that I pay them anywhere from four to $6 an hour was able to buy a home, was able to provide for and care for his family. He's got a mom who's got health issues and has, you know, siblings that he's able to provide for and care. I mean, what are some of the stories you've been able to see? I know you went and spent what a month over there, right, Justin? Yeah, I'm actually going back here with my entire U.S. I have a U.S. team, you know, of that's actually the picture you shown earlier. Um, but I have about 100 VAs on my personal team, you know, and all I can say is this, that the minimum wage in the country is like a dollar and 25 cents an hour. And so, you know, that might be equivalent to something here of 10, 12, 15, you know, wherever you live. And so um, when we pay four or five dollars an hour, kind of at a minimum side, you know, sometimes three, you know, we're paying three, four or five times the minimum wage. And so when you look at that, you know, the same situation in the US, if someone here is working a minimum wage for 12 bucks and we say, we're going to pay you three to four times that, 90 plus percent of the population is absolutely ecstatic by that. You know, that's income levels that sometimes you can't even achieve with college degrees, you know, and so, you know, there really is no special sauce or explanation. It's just pure math. It's pure um, economics that they're getting paid extremely well. And so the stories are obviously no different than in the US, right? If you took someone for making 12 bucks an hour and now they're making 48 bucks an hour, you're forexing their income of what they originally thought they were going to make. You know, there's obviously opportunities for them to start buying houses and cars. And, you know, over in the Philippines, you know, a lot of their money is spent on multi-generational housing. And the Philippines they actually care about their elderly versus here in the US. And so a lot of times, you know, there might be seven, eight, nine people um living in a house you know so those the, the, those extra funds a lot of times just go to a better quality of living for the family um which is you know for them way more life-changing than the newest car or gadget or things like that so um, yeah i think sometimes we're kind of caught up in our own little world right and we don't realize how much of an impact you can have by doing by paying in other countries or helping other people. And I've had the the same comment, well, why don't you hire people here in the US? And I have people here in the US. I have a full team, just like Justin has. He has an entire US-based team. I have a full team here in the US of people that work. I have operations manager, you know, I have a concierge, client care coordinator and agents, but I also have this entire support team that is able to support the 14 agents on my team, like I've never seen anybody do. And so a key component too, is how important it is to record the process. We've talked a little bit about that, right? Documenting every single step. In fact, even documenting a sign request, right? It's so easy to have our virtual assistants request a sign to be installed or request a sign to be taken down. 
it's all part of Trello boards that we now use, right? Yep. Doing quick performance reviews, going over what it is that you want, doing 30, 60, 90 days. After that, reviews can take place every you know, six to 12 months. But going over what's important to you and what's important to them is really helpful. Meeting regularly too. We actually meet with our virtual assistants every day for a few minutes to just go over what it is they need, what is important, what's a priority. I think that's probably the biggest mistake is their version of priority is not always your version of priority and they don't necessarily understand what's most important to you. And the only way they're gonna know that is by meeting on a regular basis. And next we also have what's called a daily checklist. What are the things that you want them doing every day? Do you want them calling? Do you want them talking to people in your database? Do you want them, you know, checking in on certain things? We now use Trello boards, which we didn't have back in the day. And Trello boards have detailed checklists of everything we want to happen. We call it our starting bell, the celebration day. What exactly do you want to have happen from your, to your client from the moment you connect with them when they're a cold lead all the way to the day that you're celebrating the keys to their home or helping them sell their home and beyond? What does that look like? And the other important thing that I think is you have to inspect what you expect. This was the best quote I ever heard. You have to inspect what you expect, meaning you expect something to be done a certain way. And if you use that Siegel approach and you never go back and check on them to see how they did it, then they don't really understand anything different than what they did in the beginning. So you have to check in and review and look at it. It doesn't mean you don't trust them. It doesn't mean that you that they don't have common sense like i would love the word common sense because here's the truth common sense is not so common to me it's a, it doesn't exist and it's a waste of time because common sense comes from experience right so yeah. if i were to walk into your job tomorrow i'd be completely lost even if you're working at taco bell they have terms and phrases that don't make sense to the rest of the world and i need to go in and kind of figure that out and understand it right and so it's really important that you inspect what you expect. Now, I'll tell you that on my team, I use a shared inbox. What does this mean? It means I have one inbox that my whole team reviews and manages. That way, somebody doesn't show up one day or they're sick or something happens. Stuff doesn't fall and drop through the cracks, right? And using it, like, for example, Justin has his inbox that his whole team manages, right? And that's important because if something happens and Justin is out or he decides to take a week off and go get engaged, right? <laughs> then somebody is still, his business doesn't stop running yep. because he chose to take time off, which allows you the freedom, right, Justin? Yeah, 100%. And it's one of those, again, until you get to taste that freedom, it's never going to be addicting to you, right? The time until you get to go on that first vacation and you know that you truly don't have to log in for the day, you know, it just doesn't seem realistic. And so you're absolutely right, you know, and that's also um, something else I always challenge my employers to do is to real, and, and I don't mean this disrespectfully to anybody, but I truly believe that just black and white, you either own a business or you own a job. Most of us own jobs, right? Even I still sort of to this day own a job, but I'm still working my way to where I can one day fully unplug. Um, real estate specifically is one of the only industries in the entire world that unless you are actively investing your extra funds into real estate itself, you are actually just owning a massive job right? For most of us, right? Some of us have teams and some of us have leverage and things like that. But most of us just own big fancy jobs that we call self-employment. Now that's really hard for a lot of people to hear. It was hard for me to hear. It's hard for me still to think today that I still kind of own a job, but it's that pursuit of getting to a place of leverage, right? If you want to be in a place to where you stop working and your money stops and you're okay with that, awesome. However, when I challenge people, most of them don't want that. And so, you know, that's for me, a really big piece of what you were just talking about is, you know, using until you have those shared things where you let other people in there and give you that time leverage back, you're never going to be addicted to it and understand its benefit because uh, you just haven't gotten the taste of it yet. So. so true. So that really wraps up the majority of our presentation. What I wanted to do is to open this up a bit and see if anyone has questions. We have about 10 more minutes left. And I thought it would be valuable if any of you guys want to ask questions, if you 
uh, want some insight or some suggestions or help, anybody have anything, you can either pop it in the chat box or you can um, open up your microphone and ask. So we get this awesome opportunity with Justin today. Anybody have any questions, thoughts, need help with anything? Also quiet. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Margaret, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Yeah, oh, go ahead. I was going to um, ask a little bit more information on the disc. Um, where can we take the disc and how can we learn more about it? So I actually have a link that I can send you for anyone who's interested. Please send me an email or a private message and I'll be happy to share a link with the, the program that I use through Ableton. Um, so just go ahead and send me that and I'll be happy to get that for you. Okay, thanks. And I think uh, you'd also asked about sharing our Trello boards. Uh, we do have some, I'll, I'll figure out how we can do that, but we do have access to some of them, yeah, where you can see everything that we do. We have Trello boards for a variety of things. We have a Trello board for our transaction coordination. We have Trello boards for our projects, which is one of my favorites because I'm a visionary. So I throw a million ideas at my team every day. And they're like, we don't even know what you want us to do or not. So they throw everything on a project board. And then we review that project board and I help them understand what is my priority and what was just a dream or a vision or an idea. Yeah. Um, what do you do with that, Justin? As far as uh, sharing Trello boards? So well, you have you guys use Trello too, right? Because I know you. Uh, use yeah, for, yeah, for a few things. Um, with it, I'll be honest with you. There's so many systems nowadays that between Asana, ClickUp, Trello, Slack, um, our team uses a little bit of all for different things. Um, we use Asana mostly now, A S A N A. Um, however, Trello for us is more of like projects, um, or like, uh, you know, we do some podcasting out of Trello, uh, but Trello is by far the easiest one to do. So if you got a team between one and five, usually Trello is by far usually the best option. Once you get past five and you need something more complex, um, and you don't want to pay a lot of money. Asana is usually that next step. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from anybody? Thoughts, ideas? Yeah, I just have another question. Um, so Justin, uh, you, yeah. you have a hundred uh, assistants yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have so many questions about that. Like what do they do? Like a hundred, like yeah. what a hundred yeah. assistants do and how do you manage the hundred? Yeah. yeah, so obviously, you know, as you grow, you, you know, you, you scale. So when I first got started, I was a real estate agent only. Like I'm a real estate agent by trade. Um, and so when I was growing my real estate team and I had buyers agents and listing agents, you know, I had, let's say five VAs. Um, that worked for that company. Um, as I started to make money, you know, through real estate, um, I started to reinvest that money into investment properties, right? So I started off with one, then went to two and three and so on. And so then instead of paying 8%, you know, property management fees, I got two or three VAs to basically run my properties for me, right? They were watching the cameras and communicating with the tenants. And so next thing you know, I'm up to eight, right? Um, and then really from there, you know, for me personally, I'm a serial entrepreneur. So I just started adding new businesses or, you know, or um, in this case, a lot of those hundred work for Sphere Rocket, which is a virtual assistant company. So, you know, if you were to actually kind of take away that sh on shock number of a hundred, um, there's probably realistically only 20 to 25 that are like personally assisting me and then 75 that are actually running a company. Um, so the 20 to 25, you know, make up a few of my real estate business. Um, I got three or four that work for me personally on my, like my personal side, um, you know, and the personal side is like, like we kind of talked about, it's coordinating travel, it's coordinating vacations, it's, you know, reminding me, hey, your fiance has a, this coming up or your parents have a, this coming up uh, that, you know, they're just doing my bookkeeping, you know, so a lot of those different things are um, what I have. So, you know, when you really look at it, I probably only have 20 to 25 that are doing personal assistant type tasks. Um, but, you know, a lot of those also come into effect. Like I have um, in about 15 minutes, my photographer is going to come in here. He's going to shoot me doing video for about four hours. He'll walk away. And then I have a video editing team, right? I have a team that will do, um, they'll chop up all the video into reels and TikToks and all of those things. And those are all done by VAs. Um, I have a social media manager VA um, that will then take all that material and put it online. Because what, what we found is for every six VAs that you have roughly, um, seven VAs roughly, you spend about four grand a month. And so whether you're there 
yesterday, today, or your business will be there in a few years, you know, four grand a month in the long grand scheme of what your goals probably are, aren't a whole lot, right? If you want to make six figures, if you want to make, you know, 200,000, 300,000 one day, 400,000, whatever that may be, one salary at 4,000 a month to have six, seven people is very reasonable um, in comparison to those production numbers. And so um, those are just a few things, you know, um, that they do. So one of the questions here in the chat, uh, Justin, what's the average rate for an experienced VA for hire, domestic or overseas? Yeah, so um, experienced VA is a very generalized term, right? So like I'll get someone to call me and say, Justin, I need someone experienced in follow-up boss or KV core. Well, remember, the, the Philippines doesn't just have a factory of people that learn follow-up boss in college. Like we barely know how to use it in the U.S. as an agent. And so what we look for is when you say experience, we'd be looking for someone with similar experience, right? They might've worked in Salesforce, which is a huge CRM that is 10 times more complicated than any real estate CRM. So in my mind, that would be experienced. And so that, for example, would be like four bucks an hour, you know, three seventy five. Five dollars. We, we our company average is about four dollars and ten cents per hour per placement. So you know sometimes people come to me and go, Justin, I need this, and I say that's seven bucks an hour. And then sometimes it's like I literally just need someone to copy and paste spreadsheets all day. I'll go cool. Minimum wage is a dollar twenty an hour. We can pay someone two fifty an hour, and they will love that job, right? Just to copy and paste all day. And so it really just depends on the job, but. Four bucks an hour is a pretty safe estimate. So that's about $640 a month for a full-time virtual assistant. Yeah, I would say that that's about average for my team as well. I pay anywhere from four to $7 an hour. And, you know, to me, it's been such a dramatic difference for my business. I can't even, if you would have asked me this 20 years ago, I would have thought you were nuts, you know, but um, it's amazing how it's really impacted my business. So all right, well, as we wrap up, any other questions? So Justin, could you post in the chat how they can reach you if they're yeah. interested in looking at hiring a VA? Yeah, absolutely. If you guys ever need to hire VAs, you guys can use this website right here. Um, just make sure um, that you put tuned up Tuesday as the referrer because uh, it gets you guys better rates um, with us than just anybody finding our website. So um just use that link there. You guys can save that, whether it's now, two years from now, 12 years from now, two days from now. If you ever just need to ask any questions, you can also just jump on that website, schedule a call. You don't have to sign up if you just got questions about VAs or, you know, you're like, hey, I might want a VA in three months, but I want to make sure I get this question answered. Just go to that website um, and uh, they will take care of you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for your time and attention today. I've been working with him since last May and uh, it's been incredibly valuable in a lot of ways. You know, I wouldn't think I could I could learn from somebody as young as him, but he's a sharp, he's a smart cat. And, and I'm really proud of, of what you've built and what you're doing. So again, congratulations on the engagement. So thank you. Thank you guys so much. Have an amazing day and feel free to share Tuesday tune-ups. We do this every Tuesday at 9 a.m. And go, feel free to uh, reach out and ask for ask for help or ask for questions. So Perfect. have an amazing day, everybody. Bye. Bye.